Thank you, Lord. So, good morning, good morning. Welcome to People's Baptist Church Bible Study Adult Forum and under various other titles. We have been meeting together studying the Bible in that church way before I got involved. Uh, thanks be to God. So, it's uh, the season that most people call Lent, this time before the Resurrection Sunday, the Easter celebration. And springtime is springing, thank God. Winter officially is still uh, with us, but it's a pleasant, seemingly peaceful ending to it, and I'm grateful. So welcome again to everyone who may be with us, anyone who may be with us. It's a great opportunity for me. This is one of those weeks that we would probably spend some time in just discussion. Sometimes I, I miss getting the feedback from the folks. But we want to look forward, and I certainly have some good news to share Every single day, the sun, in fact, let's have a little enjoyment. I have taken the one copy I have available uh, to use this morning. Thank you, Lord. Let's have a word of gratitude. We'll thank the Lord. We'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. But uh, let's just begin with this. I want to read from Psalm. We do that in the Sunday service for those who don't come to church with us, if anyone is listening. Uh, but we, we start most services it's a service of worship and so we have this usually moment we have a call to worship in fact i have the bulletin uh we print a beautiful bulletin it's amazing so we usually start with a little psalm and sometimes it's a blessing to me if we can share something from god's older testament where he spoke declared himself and they were intending to receive uh the blessing of god the revelation of god to share with themselves and the expectation was, still is, thank you, Lord. God is long-suffering and endeavoring and laboring toward this end, and we are cooperating with him, that this good news would spread out past their borders and address all of us, all of God's peoples, all of his creation. Sometimes I hear Israel, they're given sentences, sayings, the Spirit of God moves them, and they get this, and they speak out past the walls of their nation into the world at large. Here's Psalm 49, just to read a little bit. Uh, it's actually 20 verses. Grant me this time. Let's look to the Lord in prayer first. Gracious Heavenly Father, it's your day, another day you've made. We love that scripture. We love that song. We want to be glad and rejoice in it. We want something above the mundane. We want to know that you're moving toward us. We want reminders of your goodness. It's certainly available. This is the time of year we appreciate it. Lord, we're grateful people, and we want to say so, and we want to encourage each other because we're so constricted from assembling. This is a precious opportunity. I am becoming uh, more grateful for this. I am not someone who relishes in every advancement of technology and all of this, but now I can certainly appreciate it. So bless us, Lord. We assemble, however we do it, to hear from you, to commune with each other in your presence and in the knowledge of God, and praying and believing that this matters, this counts, that we're in your presence, and we ask that even now. I ask that most certainly, Lord, please. Help me be the true witness that you're calling myself and all of us to be. In Jesus' precious name, for it is his story. You gave him to us with this story. Please help us share it and let it absolutely bring forth the fruit for which you intended it. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a blessing to pray together the Lord's Prayer. Let's do that. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks be to God. 
And anyone who has joined in that knows the us in the prayer is those of us who are saying it, those of us who believe it and hope in it. Thank you, Lord. Let me read Psalm 49 because it's a, I, I want to use it. Thank you, Lord. So please, this is Psalm 49. Hear this, O ye people. Give ear, O ye inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. And then it goes on, and I should read the whole thing. But this person, and the Spirit of God uses him to address what he believes certainly one day will be and is when it's in the process of expanding to that. Hear this, O ye people, give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world. God has addressed us, humankind. And when we're sharing all the things we're given and inspired to share, it will come up that some people will share God and their experience with God. And the Older Testament is a testament of this wondrous God. And this psalm and these psalms were written to help people assemble and praise and lift up their hearts and consciousness to their God. And it helped guide them with words of praise and expressions of gratitude. And from there we branch on, we live, we add our own. I have hymn books from the New Testament peoples and it's the same kind of thing. We want to exalt the name of God. In fact, sometimes when I'm very daring, uh, I might even play a song. And I'm struggling with that on this broadcast. Please bear with me. It's very easy to, for me to get distracted by the performing of it. Let me just say this in a word. Worship to me is precious. And it's not to be done to be seen of men per se. But it's to God, and it's sometimes personal. And I, I, this is a great opportunity, and I'm told and I'm inspired to share God's word. I want to praise him. I want to praise him with people that love him. Uh, sometimes if, if the music, I just, I'm cautious, so please bear with me. Uh, but someday we hope to revive, in fact, my son is ready, I'm sure, to revive up, you know, playing some songs on here to share because joy is the strength of God's people and joy is in celebration. The Lord's Prayer ends with the phrase, to His is the kingdom. We can't do anything about that. It is and was and always will be and He's just inviting us to be aware of it, be invited into it and partake of it. But it's His kingdom and it's His power. Everything we pray that He'll keep us from evil and all the other things we've asked for, it's because he promises he has power from his kingdom to perform for us what it takes to justly be called our God, my God. And it's, it's a process for me to believe that enough to say it. He's God and he's, I'm included in those who call him God. Thank you, Lord. God is good. So this person is addressing all the earth for this God. And it's in that time, quite a long time ago, but it addresses some truths. And of course, we are developing in our knowledge of God, and God wants that for us. It is not to discredit anything before us or even judge or condemn anything that we learned uh, from or through. We want to just press on and know God as much as we can in our day and celebrate that which we have recognized or people have known God before us. I, I'm in a church I know I started to say this and I'm sometimes distracted, but I'm in a church where we were working in a building that we were going to uh, remove from the property and they used to have Bible classes in there, I believe, in one room and we found some, we found, I found a photograph, a black and white photograph of what was then the men's Bible study is what it was called, I believe, men's Bible study. And there had to be shoulder to shoulder a collection of various ages, but they were grown men, adults, and I'm going to guess 35, 40, 50 people in this photograph assembling from one church, just the male population, to assemble and study the Bible. Someone took a picture, and there's a, in, uh, a embossed, uh, covered a copy of one of the Bibles they use there. And I'm blessed. None of that was going on quite when I came there. It was uh, less population, I'm sure, that, than in the past. I've heard the stories. But thanks be to God, it's a church uh, claiming, at least in, in our confession, that we're founded upon God's book, God's truth, which we claim is in that book. And God claims his truth is in this book. 
So we rejoice. I'm going to read this because this is an expression of one person's understanding in their day of some of the issues that are raised here. And then we're going to thank God that he sent us Jesus and, and resume following him in Mark's version of the good news because we're entering into the season where he goes up to the famed uh, holy city of Jerusalem to accomplish something extraordinary in God's whole creation, especially for his kingdom. So I want to read Psalm 49. It won't take long. Let's start over. Hear this, O people. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor, together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. I will incline my ear to a parable. I will open my dark sayings upon the harp. Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil, when the iniquity of my heels shall compass me about? They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. That's the word. Or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. That he should still live forever and not see corruption. So the whole sentence would be, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses should continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. But nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. This their way is their folly, and yet their posterity approve their sayings. Selah. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. For he shall receive me, Selah. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul. And men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. My gosh, there's a lot in there and it raises a lot of issues. It's certainly addressing death and it's trying to give some comforts and it makes mention of some very clear references to life after death. And yet it never quite does enough with it. When the writer here seems to be claiming that he's going to enter into something after death and seems to be able to discern that not everybody will. And uh, some of the things we do in this life to try to hold on to this life seem vain. And uh, we thank God for the realization of that. So let's move on. But I'm just allowing us to see that many times God used Israel, is using Israel, uses the experience of what he did to address all of us. And he will address all all of us. Thank you, Lord. So with that, and <clears throat> this writer was addressing the concerns of humankind about the soul. What do we do to keep ourselves from perishing, is the word that's used, from passing away in a way that there's no more remembrance. Even if we've left a house with our name on it, a lands with our name on it, we're not there to occupy it, we're not there to preserve it the way we might have it. And sometimes it seems like vanity. And if we move on in the scriptures from there, uh, one writer, Solomon, uh, gave us Ecclesiastes. And in that whole 12 chapters, he is 
addressing continually the finality of death, and it seems that in that whole book there's not much confidence in much else after that. So we have the knowledge, we have heard the declaration, we are the people who have been moved even to believe the statements concerning the eternal part of humankind, the soul, the part that God intended and put in us so that he can communicate with us and he can preserve us. And with his good intention, his will being done on earth, he uses us. It's an insight I never had uh, in growing up my early years. I never even sought after it. The world I lived in would, had plenty to do to keep me occupied and, and pleasured, at least in my being, my present being. And youth, of course, as my wife said the other day, in our youth we think we're invincible, and most certainly that's a possibility. We certainly entertain the thought. So please, I want to turn to the Gospel of Mark. This is what we're studying. I, uh, it's too bad in, in the church sometimes. I'm a little bit, uh, I guess, I struggle with this moment because we have to go. We've explained Jesus came into the world. We've said a few things about him, only a couple of few Sundays since the Christmas season. And then we get right into this part. But to have it in the follow the seasons that the church moves in, we especially don't want to miss this chance. So we kind of leave off some of these beautiful, precious events that God used his son Jesus uh, to perform so that people then and now can marvel that God was making this kingdom we pray to be in, this eternity we hope we're part of, this thought that maybe God might allow us to live after the body finishes. And we don't seem to know as much about it, so much about it, enough about it maybe, because when some people come with some challenging ideas, we don't know what to believe. And life and life after death have been subjects of conversation, my gosh, as long as there's been people, as long as the first death, I'm sure. God doesn't want us to be confused anymore. God doesn't. God has allowed us to feel after and find him, but once we do and we find the truth, he wants us to declare them plainly for those who are seeking it. Many things are done in parables, and it's a struggle, and you got to know that you're really seeking to get through that, and God will reveal truth. Thank God. So, we are going into the time before Jesus goes up to Jerusalem, and now we're there, and we're in the season, and because we try to celebrate everything about this happening in what we call Holy Week, uh, and every week is holy, thanks be to God. Holy Week, and we know that we zip through everything, and I'm cherishing every year of my faith life that I can, not every year, but I'm working on it, and I have, that I read through, that I allow my own soul to hear afresh and un hindered, uninterrupted, with no leaven of anyone's other stuff, and just hear what God would tell us, the story of his own son. And if you're going to hear one you're in, Mark doesn't have much. It's, it's short, it's concise, it's to the point, it's good. Uh, but there are other versions that have added after, because if Mark came out first, or we seem to think so, you can see why the other writers would then later want to include other details that people would want to know. And rather than try to correct it, they simply wrote another version or two, and then John wrote the final one we have, which really is wonderfully uh, complementary to the others. It's beautiful. So sometimes on a beautiful, a good year when there's time and as a working person, uh, many times there was not. But I always look forward and now that I have things are different, I'm hoping that through that week, through those days that we read through all the account of what we believe Jesus did and said, especially to his beloved, to those who are becoming his church and those in his church are becoming his kingdom. And thanks be to God uh, for, for anyone who is hearing that call. Even now, we are the kingdom of God is still, the reason we're even saying this is because he is still seeking to include people who are not there yet to come on in, to see themselves without God and know that there is a better way to live, that there is more, it's more satisfying to be connected to the true and the living God and to know the purpose that he would 
uh, have for us and do with us. Uh, we, we, I'm sorry, I say so much. Let's just allow ourselves to hear the story. But this is a, a week for preparation to get us there. Like I said, if we were having community, we would probably have some time for discussion, questions, answers. Sometimes it's not all about feeding us all the time. Uh, sometimes we have to <laughs> digest what we've already taken in. But I ended last week with chapter 10 because chapter 11 of Mark's gospel takes us with Jesus as he begins the journey up to Jerusalem, well, and when he gets there. So chapter 10 is when he's on his way. And I believe we finished, but I read through the last part, and I'm challenged by that. So let's take this time to share. Oh, I did it again. Let's share some beautiful truths. I am a helper to the truth. I uh, have the opportunity to explain things about the truth. And I claim that, and I say that because the truth is God's word. And God has allowed me to have some experience with this, and I'm grateful. Uh, so, the ending of chapter 10, if anyone wants to follow with me, I'm in Mark chapter 10, and I'm on verse 45. We had a discussion last week briefly about the disciples' reaction to Jesus' uh, um, announcement that we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man is going to suffer, and he's going to be rejected. He's going to be uh, hurt, and mocked, and spit on, and punished and eventually killed and if you've ever been with anyone been with anyone close and they would say something like that it's startling and it seems that their reaction was that they were wondering well who was going to take his place or be greatest when he was crowned in his kingdom and they were having discussions where they'd sit and who what authority they'd have and he leveled the playing field by assuring them that look all that looks to the human eye to be places of authority or high seats of a position are really positions of labor and responsibility. And the people that are called, uh, that the world sees it as a, as a lordship position, is actually a, a servitude, a position of servitude. Jesus ends this discussion by referring to himself because he says, Whosoever of you will be chiefest shall be your servant. So verse 45 is what I'm saying to connect it with Psalm 49 that we just read. The Lord said this as he's about to go into Jerusalem to do the work that God had called him to do. Every time Jesus is communicating to us about who he serves and who he is, he's always the son of his father. He's the servant of his father's truth. He is the minister of the words that God would say if he would come down off his throne and that's what he did. He sent his son. So Jesus in verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not into the world to be ministered unto. And think of his life. He didn't sit around to be ministered unto. He came here because we were the needy. He was the supplier of our need. And even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to give out, to give us what we need. Everywhere he went, they needed a touch, a word, a, a time with the Savior of their souls, the Savior of the world, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is almost the last thing recorded that Jesus will say before he enters into Jerusalem. To give his life a ransom for many. Psalm 45 made a reference in their day what they saw as people laboring, saving up even, trying to figure out a way to be a blessing to the people that would follow after them and their family or whatever, with the hope that this would somehow enable them to have faith that maybe they would live beyond death. The soul would have some continuance, that they would be worthy of some way to believe that they would continue after the grave. And sometimes, when, and any of us, many of us, me, hit times in life where we know, pff, you know, if God came right now today, I wouldn't be worthy of anything. And we wonder what to do with that. And so it's likened, uh, even in Psalm 49, the man said, what would someone give to ransom the soul of someone else? What would they give to buy back the soul from death? And there isn't anything. And there's so many references. Peter is very good at this. Silver and gold cannot redeem us from anything, really, except maybe jail. 
But as far as the eternal soul, it's an experience that belongs to God, and only God knows exactly what he's doing. And he has allowed us as humans to, uh, one writer says, feel after and find him, you know, figure out what it is all about. And we have centuries and centuries and records of people doing that and their conclusions, and Jesus came along and he's going to show us the absolute understanding we need to have confidence in our Creator's plan, will for his creation, especially the death part, especially the death part, and then especially to answer and satisfy us with enough truth to know what to do when we set our heart to be with God, and yet we see our shortcomings. And it becomes evident by listening to other people. Uh, the Bible even says the devil himself is, is just goes around accusing us all the time of why we can't be in God's heaven, why we don't belong in his paradise. And thanks be to God, Jesus is going to address that for our, all the souls of humanity. Those that are willing to hear it will be blessed and delivered, thank God, and then certainly be able to be confident of the promises of eternal life. We said the scripture Sunday that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that perish, but to us who believe it's the power of God. Uh, to make it to for, for salvation, to sit here and say one day there'll be an eternity, one day there'll be a, uh, uh, an entering into eternity, and before that day there's some kind of decisions made and some way to know if that's open to any one of us individually. Sometimes we think if we belong to the right group of people, they'll all enter in. Well, a lot of things have happened in history and, and, and even religion, faith, uh, even God's own faith, his, his word to help us along. It's, it's been an unveiling. The writer in the psalm said, I, I, I incline my ear to a parable. Some things are deep, and you've got to really want them for God to help us uh, and to open it up and share with us because then it's a responsibility. So to understand there's an eternity, eventually we've come to the knowledge that, hey, after death, uh, there's a judgment. There's a decision-making process to decide because we've witnessed people in history and our own culture circles that we would say, if we were God and we were going to make a paradise and it was going to end up being better than this, we certainly would have to disallow some behaviors and therefore some of the people who make those behaviors their lives. Oh gosh, and a quick aside, let me just say this. I've been caught in some disbehavior, some misbehaviors, some disobedience to what I've learned is God's will. And, uh, and eventually, those become titles. If you go to the last book of the Bible and it talks about this beautiful place and outside of it are all these other things and their sayings, their words we use to describe people's behaviors, but by then they're not behaviors. They're people that have become uh, one with that behavior and therefore it's them. I would be such a one. I know I would be such a one. The world has so many opportunities to do things without guidance. I would have followed anything. I would just because of my own nature, I would follow it to the utmost. Thank God for the gospel. I've been given an opportunity to follow this to the utmost, and that's <clears throat> more challenging. But the world has a way of encouraging us, inviting us to go whole hog in some direction without consciousness of a creator and his desire and his day of reckoning. Anyway, before we go on too far. So Psalmist, uh, the Solomon himself, many other writers have contributed the thoughts concerning what of eternity, but just didn't have the clarity of proof, of answers even, to describe what actually that means for each of us. And especially if we're living in a nation that's called God's people, and then what about all the people outside of it? And so they're in still God's world. And now we have clarity. We, I have answers. I might not understand every detail, but that isn't the point. The point is that there was proof in these people's day. This entering into Jerusalem was going to change forever. The burden and bondage that men have been in because of death, the fear of death, the unknown of death, and the fact that we're just under this uh, time table, I'll call it, but really that's not even sure. But we're born into a body and we're convinced all around us that it's it's limited and its time is limited. And most of us, like me, I ignored that completely and was going to live out every day the best I could. But I started to realize I wasn't having fun. It was a burden. It was hard. It was hurting. It was painful. It was expensive. 
life wasn't free and it, and I worked hard and the harder you work the more you have to take an account of what are you working for is it worth it and gosh I didn't have to be very old to realize some of the labors that I had put forth had not brought anything really satisfying God sent his gospel into the world his invitation to enter into a relationship with him and therein he will tell us who we are and why we're here and what to do with it and the rewards, if you will, that's the word we use, but that's the word Jesus used. But the payback of what that means to be in a relationship with God, who indeed will ask of us, expect of us even, things that we wouldn't have considered before. And we're living for ourself, or for some creed of man, or whatever we belong to, uh, requires of us. And yet the reward, the payback, it is just not, you know, in the Psalm 49, they were building... Uh, monuments to each other or themselves even and uh, and and nothing is that long lasting oh gosh even as we've learned to construct things now that certainly outlast anything most things not anything but most things from history and yet we're sure that one day it won't be there Jesus is going up to Jerusalem and he turns to his closest followers and said, you people who are going to continue after me realize that you as a group of people have to behave in love toward one another and not be striving to rule over each other for your own gain or self or whatever it is. And he ends by saying that the Son of Man is going to give his life a ransom for many. What would you give as a ransom for someone's soul? Jesus said, it will take my life. And why that is and how that is and how that happens and is in this book. So, right after that is this short insight into Jesus' walking with all the power of the kingdom of heaven. He runs into a man who's blind and he heals him. And their little conversation on the way, I read through it last week and ended there, but it shouldn't be. So, But I'm, I'm a little bit excited to get into the, the story. So let me stop here and say two things. One thing is that I'll call it a disclaimer for toward Holy Week. And then I hope we can talk about blind Bartimaeus for a couple of minutes. So just hear me a moment. I am in a church. I represent the Christian faith, the New Testament gospel. And I have to tell the story, and I want to tell the story. And in the telling of the story is the mention of many names, of peoples, places, things in history to identify it as a you know there is a place of israel still here god did that for us there is a place still called jerusalem god has done that for us he has preserved that place and that name for his purpose this purpose so that we can reckon begin to recognize that this is history those of us who believe it by faith know it by faith but we want people to be assured how real this is, and I believe one day there'll be enough archaeology and other ways and science to prove it. But then what good will it do? Jesus loves us when we believe it by hearing it and realizing, wow, if there was a God and he loved this being that I am and he wanted to do the very best for it, he would have brought this about. Because this Holy Week disclaimer is where I say, please hear me, and I don't know if I'll ever do this effectively enough at the church, uh, front, but I hope to be heard right now. I have to mention the Jewish people, the people of Israel, the people of the covenant with Abraham. I have to mention Jerusalem. I have to mention the temple, the holy place of God. I have to mention Romans. We take a lot of our culture from their culture, and so you have to hear me. I have to mention, I believe Greeks are in one version of this, John's version. I have to mention Men, women, disciples, children are in there. There are enemies, and this is where it gets interesting. So I say this. Holy Week, what God has done is expose for us and to us human nature with God and without God. The writer of Psalm 49 said, There are people who behave just like the brute beasts. And when you lay them all down in the grave together, it appears we all are, until, of course, you believe the gospel of Jesus' resurrection. But, but, there are people who behave in all ways. And if we follow Jesus and his disciples, even his, among his own disciples, we are given a chance to see 
human nature exposed in every facet we need to be aware of and we should be aware how will we make it how will we wind our way through our life and come out good in the end well pleasing in the end we are taught to recognize ill behaviors actually the word is ungodliness and that's a hard word to look at something or someone else and decide that it should be labeled ungodly or without God or against God or contrary to God but we find this out there are people unwittingly who are found in their daily practice and life and position to be ungodly against God's will some of them had no clue actually but uh, it's an exposure of their intentions so all the bad behaviors of humankind are in here and it doesn't just belong to the names of the peoples and places that we have to name I say this as a disclaimer and I'm sure we could dispute this but please hear me in my heart I'm aware that if this same event had happened in the people of my culture let's my last name is Scottish so I'll use that I'm not picking on the Scottish people either but if it happened in Scotland the human nature the behaviors that were exposed they're all the same they're all there it's just that God raised up this place to call people by his name and in that place he raised up a special place to put his name in a in a, in a temple a building where people could assemble so that it was known when you were going up to Jerusalem as a patron as a follower of God's way it was known that you are serving God that you are uh, believing enough to get up to this place where his name is called that was the purpose to go there and the special favors that accompanied it God confirmed many things in that temple that he wanted to be known as his will my goodness where are we going with this well Jesus came into the world to expose to us how to please the Creator God whom he called his father whom he introduced to us and allowed us into the relationship so that we can then call him our father and all of that human nature is in each of us I'm sure I'm not a that kind of a scientist but I'm in agreement uh, everything I find in here I I've seen it pop its ugly head at one point or another in my own life and especially when I was angry against the fact that there might you know well, people would tell me there's God and I didn't believe I had no evidence there was God and the more people tried to tell me at the beginning that I would put up the defenses to where actually I'd want to you know react oh Lord help us so it, it we have to read it and I have to read it and when we're talking about uh, how people misbehaved and misunderstood and mistreated and misjudged and misconceived of what God even is in the place where his name is named among the people he calls his own and it was evident and the gospel is here among us and ours so that we can learn from it Jesus would eventually hang on that cross and ask God to forgive them so let's just hear this loud and clear I am not here as a judge or, or accuser of anything I am here to learn the lessons that the spirit of truth wants us to get from these sayings and that's the only reason I share them because they blessed my eternal soul and I can recognize my own behaviors going awry when when God brings one of these remembrances and it helps hum it has helped all of humankind those who have as there's still parts that it hasn't been exposed to this truth uh, be aware of that because when there is nobody left who has not been exposed to the story sufficiently huh, Jesus is coming but in the meantime, you know, the labor is to help people get exposed to this so they can react for themselves. I can't help anyone else believe it. Uh, maybe what I say may help them. Maybe my life, hopefully, prayerfully, some example may help them along. But it's the spirit of truth all around us that will help convince us whether or not we're part of this or we're moving or living or speaking against it these events came into this place and among these people and they simply reacted according to what their life uh, had prepared them to do there were expectations from God uh, most of the story is about the failures to live up to that and God knew it 
and he exposed them for us to learn so that we might not we're not a, we're expected not to fall into these behaviors now because there are still uh, people proclaiming this truth in places where it has never been and the same behaviors rise up and hopefully prayerfully we're learning to conquer to overcome our own temptations to fall into the human natures that are exposed here that liken us to brute beasts so it is not the people per se or the name of the army or the religious sect it's the behaviors that has put them in this story for us to learn from till kingdom come and even then we'll be discussing it for sure that's the disclaimer we can't pinpoint a people or a place in history without learning every scripture that God has given us he expects us to realize his presence is still in our world we call it the Spirit of God uh, Jesus called him the Spirit of truth and that truth will continue to confirm to anyone willing wanting seeking that these words are truth that's the promise from God that's what the Bible has become to me there's no trick to it there's just something it tells me every day when I expose myself to it that this is speaking to my soul that it doesn't care if it agrees with the way I wear my hair or the clothes I put on today or or even the name on my person or the name on my nation or house it's meant to first and foremost allow me to believe that I'm an eternal being and I'm put in a world to work out a life that I'll be that I'll actually be able to offer my creator and hope he's pleased with it when it found me I like many people uh, classified myself as a sinner because I behaved contrary to it simply because I wasn't aware or serving it or serving the opportunity to meet my maker in peace and joy hopefully if there is if it's possible I'm saved by grace but I'm saved by faith in the promises that told me I have a soul I have a soul and this story and Jesus God's son addresses my soul and I pray it helps someone else's so I can't leave this part out in a few minutes. Here's the second thing I just want to share today. So first and foremost, hear me. From now on through this story, I will be picking on uh, the Roman soldiers who beat the Savior. I will be picking on the governor who, you know, was trying not to make the wrong decision and did it anyway. I am, and I have to name them by name. But we are after what the Spirit is trying to teach us, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, present even today in 2021 March right now to help me and anyone else exposing themselves to this story what does it mean to us what do we do with it and that is how and why we can learn from all of this to be better ourselves to not behave like these people did and many of them in ignorance now we know now we know and the end of the story is so that we can know about death and we can know about the possibility of death not being our end and the judgment even after and a resurrection from the dead and that's very specific Jesus in this temple is going to show us that it's easy to say oh there's no such thing as God or there's no such thing as life after death that's one camp but there's another camp of people who just think well okay resurrection that means all of us are going to live forever and Jesus cuts right into that and says not so fast not so fast so what do we get? What do we learn? Well, we're going to go through the story. So I'm inviting anyone to hang with me while we unveil God's exposing his will to us through his beloved son. The one that the parable we talked about Sunday says that he looked down. He said, well, they'll reverence my son. And, and I take that as the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's reverence the sun. Let's make a place this season to put this story and not be running through, you know, it's just like the Christmas season. The world has a way of making this a busy season. It's Easter and I need a new jacket and all that stuff. But it's Easter and God worked a miracle that humankind cannot surpass. And so we ought to pause. We ought to listen to Psalm 49. 
Hear, O oh inhabitants of the earth, of the whole world. Listen. I listened. And I've never been the same. I will never. You can't even take it out of me. I will react well some days and maybe not as well other days. But the story has entered in and I will never be the same. And I thank the author of the story for it. And every participant that God used along the way to build me up to that day when I heard it clear enough to respond fully enough to receive what God intended. Will you allow me a few minutes then? This is part two before I have to stop today. It's not a forward lesson so much, but now maybe it will be. So Jesus said he's going to be the one to give his life a ransom for many. And I, by faith, I, by grace, I, by some confirmation of these promises, am one of the many. I'm one of those ones. Jesus had to give his life uh, a ransom to convince me to turn from my own uh, bad ends, probably, to him. And now a good expectation for my own person. And then thank God for anyone around me uh, who can believe this with me. It's encouraging. It's life-giving. Well, that's verse 45 of chapter 10. And so next week in full force, we'll begin with Jesus chapter 11 and the Palm Sunday and all that uh, events. We're going to start early so we can kind of sift through it and not, like I said, in one week fly through it because we got uh, other stuff to do because it's a holiday. Oh, it's a shame. We thank God for all the happy, cheerful things we do to help us live a good life. But we want, I want, I want to sit with other people who want to have made a place in them to give this the attention we're going to find out it most certainly deserves. Hear, O oh world, O oh you inhabitants of the earth, this glorious truth. But before that, as Jesus would go into this time and give it all that God prepared him to be for us, this little moment happened. Chapter 10, verse 46 to the end. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side, begging. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still on his way to his life's crowning labor. And commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise. He calleth thee. And if you want to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying from these truths, wow, just swallow that for a minute. Be of good comfort. Rise, he calleth thee. Don't you want to tell that to everyone you recognize is seeking something from God? I mean, he was crying out for mercy. He was begging on the highway side. Somebody might have thought he needed another donation of funds to get him through another day. But Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called and said unto him, Be of good comfort. They did, and said, Rise, he is calling me. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered. Now he's answering the demand. Son of David, have mercy on me. And he's answering. He heard, and he's answering. Like us when we pray. And it took more than once, it seems here, to get to the moment where he had Jesus' attention. But we hear that Jesus was hearing him. But his disciples and the moment he was in, it took a little bit for the man to actually get in front of Jesus' attention. Jesus answered and said, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said, and you've got to help, block your eyes and just realize this moment. He is before the Savior and he can't see. And he's asked for mercy. 
from Jesus by name. What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. All right, so he has just added himself to the multitude that is now assembling to follow Jesus in what will become this season we recognize as Holy Week. Another person affected by the abundant grace of God. It's a saying in Christianity, the grace of God is sufficient. We, we say that because we recognize when people call on God, he is able. There is sufficiency of from the source of grace to meet us and help us. This man asked for his sight. Jesus told him, your faith that brought you this far, that moved you to call on me, that patiently held you there while we were almost going by and people were telling you not to yell so loud and remain as you are and you press through and now you've got my attention Jesus might have said but he didn't short in words to the point and he said look get up go your way your faith has made you whole well there he was somehow he was blind in this moment and if he was going to obey the words of this master he was to rise and get up. Well, he already had risen and met him, but now he was to get up and go his way. And he would. And in the process of starting that, immediately he saw. His sight was restored. And what did he do? What else did he have to do? He simply turned and said, look, I'm going to follow this person in the way. Thanks be to God. I believe that's true. I believe that's part of the good news, and I believe the writers put that in there so that we can respond to this. The goodness of the Son of God everywhere he went and his desire to not pass anyone by, but to stop and address the concerns of the crying out from humankind for help, for mercy from God. All those years ago, I came into that church on a Tuesday night, Bible study. God knew what he was doing. He could have called me any night, but he wanted me to see what happens when people study the book that I had begun to read and believe. Thanks be to God. And in that, I gave my heart to Jesus in a prayer because that's how we did it. And I wouldn't have known what to pray myself, so I repeated the words of the minister, but it was simply admitting that I was without God and feeling it, knowing it, feeling condemnation, conviction, guilt, shame, heaviness, uneasiness. I didn't have real peace. If anyone really pushed me to it, I didn't have a deep peace. I lived in the generation of peace, peace. But it was fleeting. And uh, and I was invited to to come to the Lord as I was, just like this man, rise, he calleth thee. And I got up and I came to church and I sat down and I listened to words of life like refreshing water. That God loved us, that he was concerned for my eternal being, that he was even concerned for the body I'm in, that he was concerned for my life. He was concerned for the blind man. He was concerned for his soul, but his need was to see. And Jesus restored his sight. In five minutes, if I can. Five minutes. I will share my story. It's my story, and I will share it. And I will testify of my Savior. In that church, when I was converted, as it says, when Jesus said, if you really hear... You have ears to hear and you're hearing this. If you really have a heart and you can believe it. And if you do, something will happen. I wasn't the same. I'm still not the same. I was converted. Something happened. My intentions, my purpose to get up and live had been changed. I was transformed. That's a biblical saying and I love it. I was. My purpose to get up in the morning was different now. 
everything was different. It was the process of learning and, and, and trying to move into it and, and make a life out of it. I'm still doing that. I'm still uh, processing it and helping uh, try to conform to it. But God is leading because his word uh, is there for me. But in this part, <clears throat> I came to God. I came to Jesus. I was wounded. I was a human. I lived 20-something years, and I had used my vessel. I had, in some ways, abused it. And I had wounds, and I had things wrong with me. And immediately the life, the spiritual, eternal life, enters into a person by faith when they ask God to do so. He wants to do this with every one of us. To confess that I'm without God and in sin and to want to be forgiven and ask the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ by name, to do that for me. And by his Spirit, as is his will, to enter into my heart, my life, and be there and be what he's supposed to be, the Spirit of truth for me, the Comforter for me. That night, I sense this, if you will. I don't know the other word, any word to use better, but I was aware that that had truly happened, that I was relieved of weight, almost physically. I was enlightened. I was lightened. I was different. Thank you, Lord. Now, in, in, the, in the soon time, and it was a Bible study, and this is what we're gonna, where we're going with this eventually, is that studying God's Word, it was a Bible-believing church with Bible doctrine, the doctrine of biblical salvation. And I hope to unravel this a little for anyone who wants to, and we all need to know exactly what that is. Churches need to know we're believing the true thing. But along the way, I came to a time, it was a prayer day, I'm sure, I don't remember the exact details, believe it or not, but my eyes, I had very seriously affected vision. And the end, the truth, one sentence of this story is, I was prayed for, I believe God wanted to help me be better because it was a hindrance to see the way I saw. A man believed with me, sometimes we have our intercessory prayer, and, uh, and, and I was prayed for, and, and to this day, you know, God has healed me, so uh, I'm, I'm in my among my own people, and sometimes it's a comical thing, sometimes it's talked about, but it's 40 years later, and I've been down, I don't know how many eye tests, uh, how many license renewals I've been through, sometimes it's every two years, sometimes it's been three years in between, I think one year was five years, you got a license for five years, but sooner or later, every time it's renewed, we go down and you have to uh, go through an eye examination, and no one, I don't, so I don't know how many times that's been in 40 years, but it's been several, many. And I've never been required to wear eyeglasses to drive. And thanks be to God, and I used to wear glasses. And so it's a story to tell. It's not like this man. And many times I've refrained from telling it because of misunderstanding. And because sometimes in a, in a situation, you don't really own the time to tell things the way it should be told and there won't be time right now but let's just say it again uh there was a time in my life i was uh when i used to i guess i wasn't 18 yet i must have been young enough i was getting an eye examination the last one i remember having the re the record of it was and i remember this distinctly uh i had 20 over 100 vision in my left eye 20 over 100 in my right eye it was declared what is called legally blind, and I didn't care about that stuff, but we used it because the I ex it's and, he, and he's certainly uh, passed on now, but uh, he lives on Narragansett Boulevard is his name, I can say. I don't say things here because I'm not sure yet uh, what people do about names and such. But, you know, he's a legitimate uh, eye doctor, and, and I went to him my whole childhood, and he said, and, and my, le my right eye, was 20 over 400. That's a written, documented fact somewhere in a doctor's office. And when I went to this church at 23 years old, somewhere in the process, I was prayed for. I prayed. I believed it. I wanted it. I didn't like wearing glasses. I'd been in accidents. I had glass shattered in my face. Uh, they were discomforting, and they were almost dangerous. Uh, by then, they were making plastic ones, but really, my early childhood, they were glass glasses, and I used to break them. I was... 
not not a, a still child. So uh, things happened. So there I was, and it's a fact. And yet I, I, I've been in other cultures. Sometimes you talk to people, and through translation, sometimes details are left out. And so I've been. People have come up to me and, and you know, reacted in, in ways that I'm not comfortable with. Misunderstanding and thinking they've heard the story that I was blind and I was, and Jesus healed me and now I see. And thank God, spiritually, that is the exact truth. Let me declare that boldly. Yes, I was spiritually blind and now, thank you, Lord, to some degree at least, I see. Uh, and I'm asking God for more sight, insight. But I want to wind up by saying, and so sometimes it's just because of misunderstanding, and so I react, and sometimes the reaction is I don't even want to get into it and try to sort it out. So I love the opportunity to tell the story myself. I made it through life. I was wearing glasses when I came uh, to be, decide to be a Christian, a believer in Jesus. And then uh, I was praying, and I never wore them after that. I, I never wore them, and I don't know how to explain but I did see better, and it's a fact because, I, I mean, the eye tests tell you. I'm, I'm way older now, 60-something years old. And, uh, and I'm still going, you know, I don't see perfect, uh, but I've never been in an accident because I couldn't see what was in front of me. There's been other reasons, but not for that reason. I'm grateful to God. I've followed Jesus in the way. I've been trying to follow Jesus since those days. I get this man. Uh, but I want to make it very clear, my own personal situation, I had 20 over 400. It's called, in the state of Rhode Island at the time, legally blind, so that I wouldn't be able to operate machinery, fly a plane, you know, all that kind of stuff that required some kind of good sight. Uh, even though the glasses allowed me to get through life, uh, but in school, you know, there's a lot that happened anyway. So, And the, uh, the other eye was working so hard, 20 over 100, it didn't really, it wasn't good enough either. And I struggled. That's all I can say, but, you know, for 41 years or so it is, I've made it this far without the need of, and now, of course, you know, getting older, you need the reading glasses, and sometimes it's a laugh when I put them on because I, I hear somebody say, oh, my gosh, ah, finally, you need glasses. You know, well, I need reading glasses. But God is the God of the Scriptures. i got to wind up. Let's close in a prayer of gratitude. God still heals. I'm learning my way through this, but I depend on God in Jesus' name. I bring everything to him first. Sometimes I employ the aid of the medical professionals around me or such, but I'm a grateful soul for the story of Jesus. And that's how I want to enter into the story of the resurrection and the holy week before that and all that's going to happen now that we're going to get into. So let's pray and be grateful. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, it's a precious day because we've got to expose a little light from your truth. We thank you for Jesus and everything he did is r remarkable, is noteworthy. And I can certainly understand John writing that we couldn't even contain, there's no book space enough to contain all that Jesus did. Wow, can I appreciate that, Lord. I would only pray that someday, hopefully in eternity, that's what we're going to be figuring out, finding out. All the other things we don't even know yet. And we can appreciate your love for us because this all happened so that you, O oh God and Heavenly Father, can show us your heart. And if anyone can hear that right now and follow me through this season, I pray, Lord, to be able to help us do that. To know that this happened in humankind so that we can know you better and then we can know ourselves better and so that we can cooperate with Jesus your Holy Spirit in helping us do better and be better and be more pleasing in your sight. Thank you for so loving us and being patient with us as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of your Son. This we ask, I pray that today is anything today that is a helpful or spiritual food to any of us. Please don't let the enemy come and devour it and snatch it away before we get a chance to make use of it. In Jesus' precious name is my prayer. Amen.